everyone, God bless you, and thanks a lot for tuning in. I wish you a, a wonderful Labor Day. Today is the first Monday of September, and since 1894, uh, it has been a national holiday here in the United States. Also, this week will be the first of the great feasts of the liturgical year, the birthday of the Most Pure Virgin, which is Friday the 8th uh, of September. Don't miss the Mother of God's birthday. Please uh, open your ears, if you would, and allow me for a few minutes to speak with you about the call to work on this Labor Day. What is the Christian disposition to labor? And how should we think about it? You perhaps remember our Lord's words where, when he said, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. That affirmation provoked uh, a response, an aggressive uh, response from his listeners who thought that he was blaspheming because they did not accept our Lord Christ as the Son of God. They recognized in his words that he was making an affirmation about something that God does providentially, constantly, and that is God his Father and our Father by grace in Christ is constantly working. This we know for sure, and we've all benefited greatly. He's causing his Son to rise on the good and the evil, He's constantly causing the flowers to blossom and the trees to give forth their fruits, maintaining the seasons in his love for mankind and his patience. And of course, there is his sacred economy of the work of salvation, uh, which is another subject. But what I'm emphasizing is that God is a worker. His sacred work is going on constantly, and our Lord Christ claimed to be participating with his Father in that uh, providential work. We who are the height of his creation, we human beings, made and fashioned in the image of God, of course are called to a similar disposition towards labor. If God is working, if he is the supreme creator, which he is, then human beings made in his image also work. And work is something, and this is my first point I want you to grasp, it is prelapsarian. It is something that existed before the fall. Therefore, it's not something to escape. It's something basic to the human condition, something glorious, something made to be wonderful. Now, that may not be always our experience, <laughs> to say the least, in our work, in our labor. We may find it often banal and dreary, and uh, even sometimes torture. That doesn't mean that that's not valuable, that it's not valuable in our life, but work has a pre-fallen reality uh, in the human race. It's very, very much part and parcel of being made in the image of God. Of course, the fall, the great cataclysm and destruction of the human race, which took place when we betrayed God and we sought to be God without God, and to elevate ourselves to the highest in imitation of Satan and his own willfulness. When we fell, work fell with us, and our experience of uh, labor was no longer pristine. It was no longer grace-filled uh, as it was constantly in paradise. And so uh, our realms, our particular realms of labor, all were infested with grief, sweat, pain. Just think of what the Lord said uh, to Eve. She would bring forth uh, children in pain, and Adam would work with the sweat of his brow. Uh, this bifurcated view of, of labor, um, where the greatest of all labors for the female is to uh, receive the male seed and gestate a human life, and then bear this child and raise this child to the glory of God. This is the greatest act <laughs> of, of human uh, effort and creativity, and it is in many ways the act uh, for which all other forms of labor exist to support and nourish that act. And man, who 
labors to be the provider and the protector is going to do so after the fall with great difficulty, with tremendous uh, burdens. It's true. But just because it work has fallen doesn't mean it doesn't have an original pristine uh, existence and that it isn't going to be part of our future. In fact, part of our calling is to learn to work in a uh, gracious, glor glorifying God way, to try to learn to uh, recapture the dignity of human labor. This is, in fact, what uh, Christians are called to do. They're called to learn uh, how to work and serve God in love and for his glory and to uh, escape uh, the fallenness of, uh, of labor. The Lord God in his mercy offered his sacred law to help regulate man's labor and help him bear the burden of the day, so to speak, and recover his glory. And not just uh, a minor law here or there, but in the sacred Ten Commandments, in the ten words that God gave to Moses, whose feast it happens to be today, happy feast of the holy prophet and God seer Moses on this 4th of September, he gave Moses those ten sacred words, and the fourth commandment is all about labor. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and on it thou shalt do no work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter nor thy manservant nor thy maidservant. It's a marvelous text. And notice it focuses on labor, and it doesn't just prescribe labor. It doesn't just forbid it on, on the Sabbath day. It does that, of course, but it only does that after prescribing it, prescribing it, after demanding it, then it forbids it. What is going on there? Well, first, God says man is to be working. It is God's will that man work six days a week. Six days shalt thou labor. But the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and on it thou shalt not do any labor at all. And notice, not only was man forbidden uh, on the Sabbath day from doing his work, but he is forbidden from making someone else do it for him. His manservant, his maidservant, etc., are not allowed to be compelled to work. You see here this beautiful sacred rhythm that God has put into our lives, uh, the rhythm of labor and rest. Six days of labor and a day of rest. That is the path to health. That is the path to keeping labor in its proper place, neither allowing a person to become a workaholic and lose his perspective on why he's laboring by laboring at all times, nor to become a sluggard, nor to become a, a lazy person who works for two days and then takes five days off. No, six days shall thou labor and one day rest. Christians don't keep the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was a, a picture of man uh, and man's life. The principle, however, of one day of rest in seven, the church has always kept. Our sacred day, of course, is Sunday, the Lord's Day, the day of the resurrection of Christ. And we continue, we believers, continue to follow uh, the law of God in this very, very basic way. Both positively working hard for the glory of God and negatively resting also according to his commandments. This is why we spend our Lord's Day at church. This is why we celebrate the great feasts with the highest form of human labor, which is that labor which is most attached, most expressive of pre-lapsarian human labor, and also the work that believers will be doing forever, and that is the work of uh, worship, the work of sweet fellowship, the work of almsgiving and kindness. Uh, this sacred way of life uh, is the greatest of all works, and it is what we fill our lives with, uh, especially on the Lord's Day and on the great feasts of the church. We don't allow simply uh, our fallen expressions of work to dominate uh, this much higher form, the greatest form of labor, which is interior labor. The greatest work is the work of the heart, of the inner man. 
And the greatest labor with others is common worship, common selfless service, fellowship uh, to the encouragement of all. This is the work of heaven itself, and we engage with it and uh, every week on all feast days, and it rejuvenates us. It revives us. It sets us uh, on the path to continue our labor uh, in a Christian frame of mind. Now, don't uh, think that, well, you're saying this, Father, because you're a priest, and the things that you get to do are study the scriptures and stand in front of the holy table and pray uh, all the time. And uh, it's, you know, such a glorious life. <laughs> Certainly it is glorious, but uh, not like you think, not like you think. Today, as I was coming in uh, uh, to write this reflection and to produce this, this video on Monday, my day off, I came across uh, one of our ladies who, is, uh, who helps babysit here uh, at the parish on Mondays, and she was out with the little ones, the wee ones, and she was doing the work of a, a beautiful mother, cleaning up their messes and washing their uh, clothes and making changing diapers and cleaning them up. And I, I said to her as I was coming in, I said, don't think that that's very, very much different than the priesthood. <laughs> spiritually speaking, it's the same thing. What she was doing physically, priests do spiritually. We all have, no matter how uh, uh, reverence, how, how reverential our particular form of vocation is. We all bring to it uh, ourselves, which means that, and we deal, of course, with human beings, which means that we're always in a great mix. Work is hard. It's often very, very difficult, and yet its potential is great. The way to think of it is every legitimate job, every job that is uh, up upstanding, that has a moral basis and isn't in principle evil because jobs like that Christians can have nothing to do with. But the vast, vast majority of jobs from caretaking to gardening to being a painter, uh, a teacher, a police officer, uh, all of these jobs are legitimate before the face of God and immensely important in his sight and pathways of salvation for all who choose to accept God's calling of their work for his kingdom. Christians have what we call vocations. That comes from the Latin vocare, to call. St. Paul says everyone should remain in that position in which he was called. When he found himself called by God, stay in that work for the glory of God because that is the portion of God's kingdom that he has given to you in his wise providence with his eyes fixed upon you and knowing you better than you know yourself. He's given you your job to make manifest his glory right there. If you have a cubicle or a desk or maybe a truck or uh, a classroom, whatever it is, wherever you work, that is the sphere that the Lord is asking you to make holy his. Take it. Take it. Make it beautiful. Make God's presence there manifest. That's the glory of work. God will meet us there in our labors when we do them for the glory of his name. I wish you all a wonderful Labor Day, and may God inspire us all. Uh, to work for his glory. Amen. Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to present a new six-part lecture series by Father Josiah Trenum entitled Demonology, Understanding and Winning the Spiritual Battle. The study of the Church's demonology is a part of basic catechism and Christian instruction. The scriptures are replete with teaching on the dark powers, Additionally, it is impossible to appreciate the magnitude of the saving deeds of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, without understanding how He, and He alone, has conquered Satan and destroyed His works. 
Lastly, Christians are called to fight and win in the spiritual war. And for this reason, it is essential that believers understand their enemies and their tactics. Toward this end, Father Josiah presents in these lectures in-depth studies of the scriptures, divine services, and pedagogy of great saints and teachers on the subject of Satan and spiritual battle. For these and other available titles, please visit our website at patristicnectar.org.